Good afternoon, everybody. It is Sunday evening, April 19th, 2020. And tonight, we are not going to be doing the COVID cast. We are going to be taking a deeper look, insight into New York City. Insight. Stories of modern man's search for meaning. Freedom. Love. Insight. Yes, welcome to the Rick Richards Show. Tonight it is Insight, Insight into the city of New York, and we have our special guest, Angela Brown. Hello. Angela and her cat Suki, and we have some fresh scenery uh, from uh, Angela's place. Things are looking up over there, right? Yes, today's warmer. We've had like really cold weather the last couple of days, and and uh, it's like it's for once actually we have an elongated spring. Usually in New York, it's like freezing, and then it's summer all of a sudden. So an elongated spring. <laughs> yes, that could be a whole show on its own, right? Yeah. Okay, so let me get some of the business out of the way first. Uh, this is the Culture Cast Insight, brought to you as always by Athletic Alliance. God. This, this virtual background really screws up the product placement. <laughs> by Athletic Alliance, makers of the best damn supplements on the planet. If you want something to make you better, stronger, faster, and smarter, Athletic Alliance is the product for you. Most, no artificial flavors, no artificial colors. Available GNC right across North America and Popeyes at select locations in Canada, SVN coming to Amazon, so it's gonna be everywhere. I hope, I hope that's not too long. People really bitch if I start to, uh, if I go too long on the product promo. They really have a short attention span. So, let's get on to some of the shout outs. Shout outs to super fans, an electric couple. <clears throat> See, I'm, I'm, out of my, I'm out of my advanced nootropic. I need these guys to send me this one. I need- You sure you just weren't drinking? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm on- <laughs> I'm on the powdered stuff now. Uh, shout outs to super fans, Dwayne and Shar, Jackson, The Glitch Doctor, Gymnasium, Terry Shrinkage, Royan, and all the people of Daviton. Uh, super friends, Julia, special friend of the show, Lisa. And oh man, who am I forgetting? I'm always forgetting somebody. Here we have our live audience. We have our floor director, Ivan. Ivan, there we go. And uh, of course, Angela. Angela, go ahead. Do any shout outs that you might want to do? Um, well, you forgot mom and dad, so. Uh, no, shout I shouted out, out. I shouted out Davyton. And did. that's where our, that's where granny uh, resides. And our old gray haired daddy. Well, he doesn't watch the show anyways. True. He doesn't watch the show anyways. And um, it's funny. He's, uh, he's really going into withdrawals on the casinos. <laughs> oh man, it's getting a little uncomfortable. It's getting What's going a little, on? oh, well, he just, he's very frustrated, right? And, and the other day, um, he, he, he was saying to me, oh, this lockout can't uh, last much longer. And just kind of offhand, I said, yeah, want to bet? And he goes, yeah, I'll, I'll bet. I'll bet. How much do you want to bet? And um, <laughs> Ivan, goes, Ivan goes, slow down, Papa, easy. And he goes, Ivan, it's a lock. It's a lock. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted it. He, he was going to give me odds. He was going to give me three to one odds that it would go past May. And I'm like, no, dude, look, I, I don't want to be doing this with you every day. So oh, then he grumbled you. off and he, he <laughs> wandered off into his room. But uh, yeah, the old, our old gray haired daddy is, he's really kind of, he's fighting it, man. He's swimming upstream on this one. Yeah. I can't get him to call me, man. <laughs> Place a bet. I'll, I'll place a bet. I, I guess I have to appeal to his needs. Yeah, let him let him bet over the phone. That'll that'll get him out. All right. <laughs> All right. So you know what? Let's have a quick uh, COVID update. You know what? I'll, let's take a quick look at the numbers first. I'm not doing a whole lot on the COVID stuff this time. I'm I'm actually scaling it back a bit because it's getting a little monotonous. But so uh, we can see in the U.S. in total there are 763,000 cases. 40,000 deaths in total, 1,400 new deaths. Yeah. New York still is at a quarter million, 
18,000 deaths, 627. So it looks like the, 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 the amount of fatalities is falling in New York. Is that fair to say or am I off? Yes. Um, so we've been plateauing for a few days now. Um, and uh, I believe to either today or yesterday was the first day that we didn't have deaths in the, in the thousands yeah. in New York. Uh, but right now we are, we do have a total of 8,448 deaths in New York City alone and over 126,000 cases in New York City alone. Yeah. But yeah, then well, we're, the, we um, are confirmed that we plateaued and now we're looking forward to the dip. Yeah. Looking forward to the dip. That's what I used to say when I went to um, uh, Pizza Hut. The, um, one of the interesting things, this is definitely a, um, it's definitely a big city problem, isn't it? Yes. Um, and I mean, when I, I think that most of the places that have been doing very poorly uh, with this are, are cities that are congested, walkable cities, the type of city I want to live in. Lots yeah, of crowded cities, and, and particularly in the east. I mean, you know, it's surprising that it hasn't become more of a problem in certain places. Um, but in, in Canada, for example, this is really a Toronto-Montreal problem. O outside right. of the major cities, the only places that are really seeing much of an effect are, um, are old folks' homes, right? Yeah, the old folks' homes. Well, finally, just over the last week, they've started disclosing the amount of uh, people that have been sick and dying in the uh, old folks' homes. But until then, it was anybody's guess. And also, there were apparently some places that were hiding the amount of deaths and not being honest. Hmm. The, um, not being transparent. Yeah, well, you know what the challenge is? I think in a lot, what, they're actually not even called old folks' homes anymore. What are they called? Long... Term long term care. health facilities. Yeah, God, they, they always have to fuck around with the names of things, don't they? <laughs> and your whole life getting used to one name and then it's something else. They actually try to be a positive spin on it, though, right? <laughs> yeah, some euphemistic positive spin, right? Like, yeah. you're not going bald, you're just scalp gifted, right? Yeah. <laughs> not short, you're vertically challenged. Follically challenged. Yeah, follically. Um, follically disenhanced, disenfranchised maybe. So uh, yeah, that's mostly what it is, right? And uh, I think, I'm not sure what the life expectancy of someone in a long-term old folks home is anyways. Like when somebody goes into one of those places, are they there for months or are they there for years? How many no of them die on a regular basis anyways? Like, I mean, we really don't know this stuff. Like how often um, do people in that situation get pneumonia, right? Yeah, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Well, that's the problem. It's really just a guess, right? And I mean, none of us know. And um, so, yeah, the um, some of the other countries, Spain and Italy, their death rate has kind of fallen way down. Spain's is 400 now. Italy's 400. Italy's was over a thousand for a while. Um, yeah. But it's they're definitely on the downward slope of this, right? Yeah. What's interesting is Russia. Russia, I mean, for a huge country, they only have, and they're testing a lot. They've tested nearly 2 million people. But they've only had 361 people die. And in Moscow, Moscow, it seems to be bubbling up as a bit of a problem. And yeah. Moscow's a huge city. It's like 15 million people there. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's like total lockdown. You have to have a special pass to go anywhere. Yeah, my uh, roommate, uh, he's Russian, Oktai. His uh, father, a really good friend of his father, uh, is very sick. His entire family is very sick with COVID right now. They just got it last week. And which city do they live? Uh, Moscow. Oh, yeah. See, yeah, so there we go. I mean, that seems to be the pattern that's occurring, is that it's a really a major problem in the cities, right? Yeah. So. So. And, you know, I mean, I'm not quite sure, but my other roommate, Derek, he seems to think that, um, well, they're saying that a lot of African-American communities are, are far more affected by it. And we are also thinking that maybe there's living in conditions. He's convinced that they're living in conditions where they're closer and it's harder to get away. Well, yeah, I think there's probably a few things that play into it. I mean, yeah. um, people, people that are obese or have high blood pressure or um, other signs of uh, metabolic syndrome seem to be uh, more affected. Right. That as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's it's actually seems to be lowest among Asians, and which is ironic because I mean that's where it started. Or maybe pregnant women. Huh? Pregnant women. Really? 
Yes. Yeah. They found out that pregnant women don't show any sign. They're very asymptomatic. Um, but once they give birth, they develop symptoms. Huh? Boy, that would be kind of shitty. That was you, a new birth. Birth. <laughs> you just went through uh, birth. Guess what's coming next? <laughs> that would really, um, that would be a very demoralizing no. period. So yeah, obesity. And then, I mean, certain cultures are um, much more social, I would say than others. Right. Yeah. Totally. Mm hmm. And, and it's funny because Ivan and I were talking about that on the way in, in that Africa, you hardly see any cases in Africa. And is that because they're just not being tested or um, they don't have the facilities to report or they're just not getting it? And I mean, a lot of the comorbidity or underlying conditions that make people more susceptible are not present in Africa. Like they don't have a very old population. They probably don't have a lot of diabetes or high blood pressure or any of those processed things. Processed foods, as many processed foods, maybe. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it seems to be a virus that, um, yeah, it's kind of calls the herd, you know, like it goes after the, the fat and the... Um, Modern day problems. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I, we could go down a few rabbit holes on that one, but it's probably, mm -hmm. probably best to avoid it, right? Yeah, let's avoid it. For fear of pissing people off. <laughs> okay, so I wanted, to, um, I wanted to do a deeper dive into New York. Okay. And so let's start. <clears throat> so new, here's the thing that I find interesting. Um, New York has obviously been very severely affected by this, right? Yes. And um, it's interesting just to see, I mean, New York is an old city, you know, I mean, by North American standards, New York is, um, you can see on the screen here, New York was founded in 1624. Mm -hmm. It was the first permanent Dutch settlement established at Fort Orange, which is now Albany. One year later, Peter Minuit purchased Manhattan Island from the Indians for trinkets worth about 60 Dutch guilders. Huh. Wow. They, they pulled a Trumpian, uh, <laughs> a Trumpian art of the deal on them, right? Yes. And they founded the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, which became New York City. Um, they surrendered to the English in 1664. And that, that's, of course, when it became New York, named after the um, town of York in northern England. Have you ever been there? I have never. Huh. It's, it's always kind of, it's kind of interesting when a city is named after a place and then goes on to become way bigger and way more famous than the place it was named after, right? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, in four more years, New York is going to be 400 years old. Wow. Yeah, that's a long time, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, was, I was kind of thinking of just the cycle that civilizations take, you know? I mean, you often see a cycle to civilizations, right? They have a rise, they have a peak, they have a period of, uh, say, decadence, and then they have a precipitous decline usually, right? Mm -hmm. And New York has gone through, I think, a few of those, right? New York's gone through a few periods of rise and then yes. saturation, peak, immigration, stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then descended and then managed to rise again. So I wanted to kind of look at sort of the history of New York, the ups and downs, and um, maybe determine whether that's applicable to the United States or Western civilization at large. So shall we? Sure. Okay. So the history of New York, um, as I say, it became New York in, uh, it was founded in 1624, but became New York in 1664 when it was renamed. Interestingly, that was the um, the first the first continental um, billionaire. Well, actually, I don't know if he was a billionaire. The first mega rich of the um, the robber barons they used to call him, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. He was Dutch and he lived on Staten Island and he started a ferry service um, from back and forth from I guess Staten Island to um, Manhattan, and he built up a business and he was the first of the uh, mega rich people to come out of the New World. He still has a mansion up in uh, upstate New York. Oh, no, no, that's not him. He died. He's, he's been dead for probably 300 years. Now. Yeah. I know. <laughs> his oh. family. Hello. Yes, exactly. The, the Vanderbilt family. Um, so 
Africans first arrived in 1626, so they've been there quite some time. Uh, they brought them as slaves. They basically built New York, from what I understand. Yeah, well, certainly, I'm sure they built a good portion of it, right? 13,000 yeah. slaves uh, by 1756. It, you know what? It's interesting to think, too, that New York was a city for 150 years before America even became a country. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's a long time, right? Yeah. And if you think of the founding of New York from 1624 to 1861, when the Civil War was, New York, I think, I don't think it was, it was a colony before that and then became a state. Oh, no, actually, that would have been after the American Revolution. But prior to the Civil War, New York had been uh, there for 240 years, almost longer than after the Civil War. So it's got a longer pre-Civil War history than a, a post-Civil War history. It's funny. It's fun seeing how it developed, too. Uh, I mean, it did develop quite slowly until the mid-1800s, and then mid-1800s, it really did boom. Yeah, and its positioning kind of made it ideal as a um, jumping-off point for um, uh, immigrants, particularly from Europe. Germans began immigrating to New York in the 1700s. Uh, most of them were Protestants um, that had relocated to Holland and then England and then made their way to New York. In 1710, a little over 2,000 Germans arrived in New York. Doesn't seem like a huge number, but I guess at the time it was. Um, when the um, American Revolution ended in 1783, New York became a state. The Dutch, British, Germans, and newly freed Africans. Africans were freed between 1799 and 1817, so well, well before the... Um, the Civil War. Uh, then the Irish came en masse in 1847. Uh, over 50,000 Irish converged on New York City. That year, over 50,000 new Germans also moved into New York, causing widespread panic among the 300,000 New Yorkers already living there. Uh, the immigrants were forced into the worst jobs and worst homes the island had to offer. And this, this initial massive wave of immigration kind of led to the first, um, I guess you'd say, standards of poverty, right? Yeah. And it was in really? the 1880s that um, um, uh, the Statue of Liberty was built and put on Ellis Island. You're aware of that, right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, right? Of course. Um, I, did, I was looking at some videos earlier today, though. It was funny. I, I had no idea that they were sort of displaying different parts of that statue in different uh, areas. And then finally it was brought together and it is where it is right now. But uh, it wasn't just New York's at first. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a, a gift from France, right? And so uh, the 1880s, they saw the beginning of new immigration and this was to um, replace people that had been killed um, or decimated uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the Civil War. So. There was a big rise up of immigration um, prior to the Civil War, and that I think kind of exasperated the differences. What was what had been thirteen colonies um, began to take on kind of a new a new form in that the um, the South remained agrar agrarian, uh, basically a slave economy, whereas the New York um, or, or the North began to industrialize and producing products and stuff like that, and I mean. You know, part of it is the abolitionist movement that wanted to end slavery, but part of it was um, that um, slaving colonies were not really purchasing colonies. They wanted consumers and stuff like that to purchase um, a lot of the consumer goods that were being manufactured in the North. And of course, I mean, that stuff, you know, and that eventually became an intractable um, set of differences that resulted in the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, there was a great deal of uh, loss of life, of course, and that facilitated uh, large waves of immigration. This time, it was new immigrants that were uh, mostly uh, Russian Jews, Greeks, and Italians. And they settled in ethnic neighborhoods in and around New York City. And this was around the time of the Industrial Revolution, so uh, most of them were funneled into uh, those sorts of jobs, as well as domestic immigration from other parts of the U.S. At one point, like a quarter of the population here was Irish. Uh, yeah, well, that probably would have been in the 1840s, right? Right after the um, Irish uh, potato famine. or just Yes, famine. exactly. So <clears throat> it's interesting that, like I said, New York has had a lot of waves in, in terms of um, 
poverty and then sort of recycling out of that poverty, then descending back into poverty again. So it ascended from a small seaport to an international city in the 1800s and underwent severe growing pains, filth, disease, and disorder ravaged the city to agree to a degree that would horrify even the most jaded modern urban dweller. Uh, New yeah, York. A lot of stories. Yeah, you've heard some? Well, I mean, uh, I've, I've read some, uh, you know, turn of the century, early 1900s, the living, the so many immigrants coming here, uh, the living conditions were just full of squalor. There were families living under stairwells. There were children just laying in poop. It was just really, really bad. Water was contaminated because there were dead bodies in it. Huh. Sounds, sounds like a nice place. <laughs> Um, the population was 30,000 in 1800. So, I mean, even back then, that was not a big city, right? That was a, a town, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but it began to essentially double in size every 10 years. So, by the turn of the 20th century, the population had reached 4 million. So, it doubled every 10 years and kept doing that for uh, 100 years. I think uh, in 1924, it was the most populated city in the world. Yeah, I think that would probably be right. Isn't was the Empire State Building? When was that built? Was that in nineteen? That was built in the tw uh, crap. That was built in the twenties or or the forties. I can't hmm. remember. Yeah, uh, the turn of the nineteenth century, New York's infrastructure relied upon disease-creating entities such as the horse. Between one hundred thousand and two hundred thousand horses lived in the city at any given time. That is a lot of feces. That's crazy. Each one of those horses gave off 24 pounds of manure. <laughs> gave off. <laughs> hey, please take the manure. Uh, and several quarts of urine a day. Good God. <laughs> animals, these horses. Uh, the vast majority of city horses were not elegant animals who pulled carriages and lived in stables near homes of the wealthy. Most were big work horses who did all the hauling and pulling wagons loaded with goods from the shore. So that is... Uh, Pigs regularly roam the city, so it's not a pleasant place. And I have no. here some early photos from 130 years ago. So this is late 18, late 19th century. Here you see some little urchins. Mm. Here you see an annoying ad from learning a new language at home. Uh, Jacob Reese took these pictures, a Danish immigrant. Now it's one of my favorite beaches. What is there's a Jacob Reese beach here. Oh, okay. There you go. You're dropping some knowledge bombs, some some local knowledge bombs. Your local knowledge bombs, yeah. A cobbler living in a coal cellar. Oh, yeah. And you can see very squalid conditions. Yeah. The tenements. Yeah. Manhattan's Lower East Side. You lived in the Lower East Side, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I lived in the Lower East Side. Um, when did I first moved, like to, that? I moved to the East Village, and I was there for about a year, and then I moved to the Lower East Side from uh, 2002, right? Shortly after 9-11, actually. Shortly after 9-11, I moved to the Lower East Side, and I was there till 2004. Did you and I was there when it was just developing, really. I mean, when I moved there, there was one coffee shop that turned into a bar at night, and then there was this one... I'm going to call it an institution because it's been around forever now. Welcome to the Johnsons. It's a bar that was down the street. That was it. That's all there was. And then by 2010, it was Posh Central. Hmm. And you lived in, uh, I imagine you lived in a state of squalor, right? <laughs> no, I did not live in a state of squalor, but I actually did. I forgot to do it, but I was thinking of uh, pulling up a picture of the place that I lived in then and the rent that we paid and pulling up a picture of what it looks now and what people pay for it now. Like, insane. <laughs> and that's just recent, right? Well, no, that's early 2000s. So that's still, that's like... Well, uh, that, that's what I mean. I mean, over the 400 year history, it's fairly recent, right? Yes. <laughs> 20 years. Okay. So you know what? Let's... So here you can see the late 1800s, uh, New York was really kind of a shithole, to be honest. I mean, <clears throat> mostly wooden built uh, buildings, you know, the uh, fire would go through this. And th there probably has been a few fires in New York, I would imagine. But uh, yeah, I mean, in the in the 70s, uh, as they were saying, they say the Bronx is burning as the Bronx was burnt. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what? let's, like let's get through. Falling. Let's let's move on. And um, 
Yeah, let's let's <clears throat> let's fast forward. So the uh, so I mean, basically throughout the 20th century, uh, New York it had kind of cleaned up, I think, to a degree um, from that period of squalor in the late 1800s there, and it became you know a more international cosmopolitan city right through the first half of the um, uh, the 20th century. There was a lot of building. Um, it became this New York Stock Exchange obviously is open there and it became kind of the financial hub of definitely of North America and more recently the world, right? Right. And now you moved to New York in... Um, 2000. Right. And so what was your impression of New York growing up? Before growing up before I ever went there? Yeah. Uh, well, I think my impression was tainted by the show Fame. <laughs> Okay. As a young, naive kid, I just loved that movie. And I just, I just, I, Sesame Street and fame, honestly, that's the only impression I had of New York. I was just like, it's, it's people talk to Grover on the street. It's fun. It's very community oriented. There's not just white people there. There's people of all nationalities. And then uh, when I, yeah, I was hot for Leroy. Here come the puppets. The gay mm. character, of course. And <laughs> yeah, so I, my impression was uh, that it was a creative place, very naive. Okay, so you 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 were under the impression that there would be a lot of diversity there, which obviously there is there and yes. everywhere now. Um, mm -hmm. And there would be puppets and uh, music, <laughs> music and puppets, essentially is what. Yeah, as a kid, York. music and puppets. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, one of the interesting things about New York, you know, I'll I'll play a few videos while we uh, talk here. But I have some color videos of uh, New York from back in the day, way back in the day. And you can see it was kind of an interesting place. People, people dressed well back then, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I see there's a legless man there. Yes. Yes. Very, very unfortunate. Yeah, it's weird. I never, I never intended on moving here. I always had my sights set on, set on London, England. But uh, the, 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 the fact that I came here at all uh, uh, was completely unexpected. So I definitely didn't grow up like fantasizing about New York City. No? No. Well, that's, um, I mean, a lot of people really did though, right? Yes, a lot of people did. I was always fantasizing about London, England. So yeah, New York definitely had this kind of, um, it kind of had a real vibe to it, right? For a good portion of the 20th century, you know, the book Catcher in the Rye was based in New York and that was, um, what was that? Like right, I guess right after the war or something like that, right? But it, you know, New York, it got the reputation of a city that never sleeps, right? Yeah, um, my my favorite time in uh, New York City history is uh, is around the late seventies, and there's a documentary a lot of people can watch, and it's called uh, New York NY seventy seven, the coolest year in hell, and it uh, really it really shows a time when New York was uh, economically at one of its worst points in modern day history, and uh, all the creativity that popped out of the scene at that time, and then uh, the mayors changed, and it eventually you know started getting a lot better, but. So what, what, what do you think led to it becoming such, I mean, New York, it, I think the city almost went bankrupt in the 70s. There was an yeah. incredible rate of uh, crime, a huge underworld, you know, there was prostitution was rampant, um, theft, Drug. street theft, street crime, all of that stuff was really kind of out of control. What, how do you think it got to that point? Um, actually, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how uh, New York, uh, that's one thing I haven't researched. <laughs> oh, well, it bears thinking about, though, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, if you're a person that lives in an area like that, that's descending into a state of lawlessness and crime and, you know, danger, right? I mean, <clears throat> there's probably some lessons to be learned there. And who knows? Who knows? I mean, that, that would require a deeper dive, right, to go in and find out what's, what were the social conditions, um, what were the financial decisions? Because, I mean, New York following the um uh following the war it was a pretty industrious kind of productive place and definitely a magnet and for it to go in the space of you know and probably that way right up until what would you say the early 60s maybe yeah so for it to go from that to you know bankrupt and crime ridden in the space of 
15 or 20 years, that's not a super long time, right? So, yeah. I mean, there really must be something there um, that we could uncover and, and, you know, kind of dissect and, and figure out what happened, right? Yes, actually, um, yeah. All right, let's, let's adjourn. Let's go research that. <laughs> oh, hold on. Hold on. We're not going to let you off just yet. So this is an interesting thing. This is from the 70s, and um, this is the Bronx was a war zone. No, apparently yeah. the Bronx was not a nice place in the 70s. I was born and raised in the Bronx. At one time, the Bronx was a thriving community. Towards the end of the 60s, that started to change. Businesses moved out. Crime moved in. See, so what's interesting is from, from, from his telling, um, he, he says it from a very passive point of view. Things mm -hmm. started to change. Businesses moved out. Crime started increasing. Like, those things don't happen. Those are symptoms, right? They, something else triggers those things to happen. Yeah, I do know that the Bronx was uh, like uh, middle class, a uh, nice neighborhood, <laughs> or neighborhood, nice area uh, up until the 70s. No job opportunities, schools being closed down, shop owners leaving. Just imagine World War II bombed out Berlin. It was just a, a war zone. Arson, murder, robbery, rape, burglary. It was considered the murder capital of the United States. The worst ghetto in all of the United States. At the epicenter of this crime wave was the NYPD's 41st Precinct, also known as Fort Apache. The 4-1 was the busiest in the city in all levels of crime. Hands down, most dangerous square mile in America. Well, um, I know that this, uh, the Vietnam War was right before this. I'm not sure how much of the, an, an economic impact that had on the city, but I do know that um, by the time 1977 came around that uh, there was too much unemployment. Uh, even the police were getting laid off and, and not even wanting to do their job. Hmm. But so you saw this and that, uh, that appealed to you. That's what I find. I find that a little surprising, actually. No, what <laughs> I saw what what appealed to me was um, the creativity that came out of the hard times in 1977, in particular. Okay, so I mean, and then the economy lifted up from there. Well, what lifted the economy up? Like, <clears throat> so okay, so New York was definitely at its, um, I guess, at its bottom, right at its pit. Um, towards the late 70s, early 80s, and then it began kind of a remarkable revival, right? Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. And so what's that, what do you think led to that? Uh, well, I, hmm, you know, I'm not sure why economically it was doing better. I just know that uh, a lot of uh, people were feeling a lot more creative, um, a lot more uh, empowered somehow. Uh, I don't know. I do know that uh, during the blackout in the Bronx, uh, a lot of people stole a lot of equipment. Therefore, let's just say overnight, a lot of DJs stole their equipment. There were DJs the next day, etc. Somehow, people found a way. I don't. I don't know if there was any um, government state help at all, really. Um, well, I know. I know Rudy Giuliani when when he first got into um, when he became the mayor of New York. Uh, as far as I know. Uh, he instituted um, what they call a broken window policy. So that, and what that meant was they were going to be very, um, very vigilant and very prosecutorial uh, towards small kind of misdemeanor crimes because yeah. that would deter larger crimes, right? So if a window was broken or even if somebody was doing something small, they would, um, they would enforce the law and they would um, prosecute the people. And I, and yeah was very strict. Uh, uh, he did clean things up a lot. He did clean up the uh, uh, Times Square area. and um, uh, But he also did a lot of other annoying things <laughs> that to me didn't seem very necessary, like in the late 90s, the cabaret license law, where um, you weren't allowed to wiggle your hips in a bar because that was considered dancing. Hmm. 
So let's let's talk about just your experience. I mean, you've lived there for what, 20 years now? Yeah, it'll be 20 years this May. Okay. Um, when you first moved there, was the um what were what what were some of the gentrified areas like? Like um uh Brooklyn, for example. Brooklyn Brooklyn's gentrified now, right? Yeah, I don't even think I stepped foot into Brooklyn until uh two thousand who so it took me about a good two years and it feel, felt I came to Park Slope which is very um, friendly and family oriented and uh, super gentrified but uh, back then it was still very industrial um, in Gowanus in particular the Gowanus Canal around that area that's the one area that I visited in 2000 maybe halfway through 2001 even um, the gentrified areas, uh, Manhattan was very gentrified. Uh, lots, of lots of areas of Brooklyn were still not gentrified. I, I first moved to Bed-Stuy in, uh, I believe, 2008, and cab drivers didn't know where that was back then. Mm. You know, Mike Tyson's from Bed-Stuy. Yeah. Just, just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, is, would you say, first of all, did hipsters exist when you first got there? No hipsters did not exist when I first got here. I honestly feel like um, my opinion of how hipsters developed, it was like, it was, a, so after 9-11, there was uh, another creative push, much like uh, uh, the creative push that happened in 1977, because it was very music and dance and band uh, oriented. And uh, there was, there's a lot of creativity. Um, no, I have a theory on hipsters. What? You like to hear it? Go for it. Okay. I think hipsters are, um, they're clearly, they're searching for authenticity, right? And they're, they're searching for uh, craftsmanship and things like that, that are out, they're, they're, they're reactionaries to um, atomization and mass production and those sorts of things and, and kind of the plastification of culture. So, so they're directing, they're directing their interests for authenticity, but in a consumerist fashion, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I, I think they're, um, you know, they're more or less harmless, right? They, you know, they like things like cereal. Yeah, but also the whole, uh, the whole definition of hipster has changed because I honestly feel like the hipsters were just a bunch of us hanging out in the Lower East Side in the early 2000s, getting drunk, going to bands, going to parties, um, having fun, being creative, making some stuff, being in art shows. But yeah, there was definitely a creative element in a, um, let's say, a, a, a slight business development element, but I think really it was more about um, just being in the right place at the right time, being cool and um, knowing how to utilize that. And I think it eventually it's, people have taken the term and morphed it into so many other things. Mm. Are they, are they but yeah, you've boiled it down to what I think what it really is now. Are, are and I they, think that's actually noble, so I don't have any issues with, with it. Are, are they still a thing, hipsters? I think it's been quite watered down at this point. Yeah, probably watered down to, to the point that almost all millennials are hipsters to a degree, right? Yes, as long as you're not a trust fund kid. <sighs> well, <laughs> I wish I could be a trust fund kid. That was always my dream. Well, there's plenty of hipsters that are trust fund kids too. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, it is, it has kind of, the hipster phenomenon has kind of really um, spread to every city in North America, I would say. I'm pretty sick of hearing the term too, actually. Yeah, okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> I won't mention it anymore then. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know I was being offensive. But <clears throat> so what's, what's your thought on uh, gentrification? Because you know a lot of people are my, my thought on gentrification is um it's it's good and it's bad. Um it is good because a lot of the places that are gentrified, before they were gentrified, they don't have enough money put into them. It's it's like until things start to become gentrified, the city doesn't want to put money into that area. And it's not until things start to get become gentrified do you start seeing better stores, better places to buy grocery, better groceries within that store, um, just more amenities uh, for your daily life to be better, easier for you. You know, 
So you use ultimately you see gentrification as a positive thing, right? I see gentrification positive um, if it stops at some point, but then gentrification. I've seen I've seen neighborhoods that have gone from literally nothing. There's nothing there to happily gentrified, where um, uh, all the cultures and uh, different economic so, um, uh, levels can live together comfortably or not so comfortably, but with hopefully less tension to things being just way too overdeveloped, way too expensive. Uh, nobody can afford to go to these places. So I, I think gentrification is good if, if it stops at a certain point. Well, I mean, ultimately that's the problem with any kind of um, transformation, isn't it really? Like yeah. I mean, any neighborhood, I mean, you want some development. Nobody wants to live in a forest. Well, I mean, some people do, but the mo most of us don't want to live in a field by ourselves or a forest. We want some sort of development, but yeah. you know, what's the right level of development and when can you stop it? Right? Yes, exactly. So yeah, that's a, the two sided coin. It's good to a degree. And then how do you stop it from steamrolling everybody? Yeah. I mean, you get that with, with every sort of, when it, any kind of, um, any kind of new group moves into an area, right? Whether it's middle class people gentrifying an area or immigrants to an area, like it or not, your neighborhood's gonna change, right? And there may be some things that start to improve. You may have access to services that you didn't previously have access to, yeah. but you may end up also getting priced out of the market, right? Exactly. Or, and the same, the same thing, if different ethnic groups or uh, immigrants move into an area, the same sort of thing can happen. At first, you know, you may reap the benefits in that there's better pricing, more access to workers or, or whatever, but eventually, I mean, it doesn't stop. It just keeps moving until it's not really, um, it's exactly. not really, yeah. And right now I'm in my third neighborhood in that I've lived many different places here, but right now I'm in the third neighborhood I've lived in that has been gentrified um and this i haven't been priced out of this one yet so <laughs> i've have been you, here have you ever considered that you may be a harbinger of gentrification that you may actually be part of the gentrification process of course yes i know i am anybody no. who buys an apartment in an area where the rents are low but you see that there might be you know some development going on is Anybody who just wants cheap rent in a place that's promising is is a problem, <laughs> I guess. Well, you know, I mean, in fairness, I, I don't really think that there's any city that is immune from some form of gentrification because you have to think as a city, a lot of work goes into building a city. Like creating a city is literally probably one of the hardest things humans can do. You're essentially carving infrastructure out of complete wilderness. You're laying streets, you're laying... Um, sewage you know sidewalks buildings all, all this stuff right so there's always going to be some inherent value there you know and yeah. you know what maybe it may um it may be dilapidated or it may get run down or whatever um but at some point there's going to be some some value in it just based on its location and even the very basic infrastructure that still remains right yeah Oh, it's so right now, um, so my roommates and I have been in this gentrified area or gentrifying area for three years now. And it's really interesting to see in this last year, I feel like the population has just doubled in this area. And um, I honestly think it's only a matter of time before I can't afford to live in this area either. So, <laughs> huh. so you're kind of a first wave gentrifier and the second later waves of gentrifiers kind of push you out. I am a first wave gentrifier. <laughs> you know what? You know what you're like? It's like the initial waves of the Irish. Then they fought with the Italians when the Italians came in, right? Right. You're the first wave. And then you're rebelling against the second wave of gentrifiers. <laughs> okay, let's move off gentrification. The, the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, drug addiction and homelessness. Is, is that, has that changed uh, since you first moved there? Is it worse, better, the same? Uh, I don't, actually, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think I see less homelessness because the streets are cleaner. Um, literally, since I moved here in 2000, um, it's just gotten shinier and shinier here, I swear to God, except for the, the brief, we've had two recessions since I've been here, um, but uh, I didn't, I haven't really seen an increase in homelessness because of it. Uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I haven't really seen the effects of that. You know, it, it's really strange because New York is completely out of step with almost the rest of the country and the rest of the continent. I mean, homelessness and drug addiction are massive growing problems almost everywhere. But New York seems to be, you know, completely opposite to that. I, I mean, clearly I see people that um, I think are living on the streets, but I don't know if they're living on the streets. You see tons of people out there begging for money, um, but also there are a lot of people that just like the lifestyle of living on the street. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Huh. All right. Well, Some people like it. Yeah, I guess there's a certain, um, I guess there's a certain sense of freedom sleeping on a sidewalk. But clearly there is a lot of homelessness here. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people living in poverty here. So yeah. a ton and a ton of people with kids, with families. Is, is it more or less? I, honestly, I don't know. I haven't li looked into the statistics. I can't, I can't give you that answer accurately. I mean, just, just by your own observations. Does it seem like it's a growing problem or is it? I think it's a growing problem. I think it's a growing problem because I think New York is becoming completely unaffordable. Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, real estate's been an issue there for a while, right? Yeah. What do you think is, um, what do you think is going to be the result of the, um, all this COVID lockdown? Like, is there, are, are you seeing people starting to have economic problems or other psychological problems, things that extend beyond the actual virus itself? Uh, yeah. Um, yes, definitely. There's, um, the crime was on the rise. Um, I think crime has dipped again, but I think that's just because maybe those people got sick not quite sure. Um, definitely there have been some um, bodies that have, that have been recovered from the water and uh, that's not something I've heard of or people who have thrown themselves in front of trains. So there are some suicides here. Uh, economically, we're not quite sure. Um, so far, uh, a lot of us feel like we're, we're being taken care of okay. Um, I'm on unemployment, as you know, and I've mentioned it a couple times on the show already, but I, who knows what's going to happen after this? I mean, it is the great unknown. It's the great unknown. What the fuck is going to happen to the economy <laughs> in, in six months? Where are we going to be? Well, is there, um, like, do your employers, are they communicating with you guys? Do you understand what their status is? Or? Um, they, no, they're not communicating with us uh, uh, regularly, um, although our general manager reached out about a week and a half ago and wanted to double check and make sure see who was able to get on unemployment and who wasn't and his general message was just keep on trying so i don't know if our company's actually doing something special for them or not for people that are having problems getting on unemployment but it's uh so uh, I have one roommate that's been flown back from Paris. He was working in Paris. He's in Texas right now, and he's going to be coming by the end of the month. And he's been furloughed from his company. So um, his suggestion was he actually had us ask our, our landlord if he can reduce our rent by 25 or 30 percent. And we're like, well, sure, why not? It's worth a quest. It's worth an ask because we don't know where we're going to be financially next month, even. Right. And what did we you don't know? Do? Just because I have unemployment right now, who's to say that it's uh, I'm going to keep on getting unemployment if something's not going to happen at some point? Because uh, right now it's ridiculous how many people are unemployed. Well, and I mean your restaurant, I, I bet they still have to pay rent or their lease, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so how, long, rent how long can they do that? Sorry, we're protected from being evicted, but we're not rent protected. Like we have to pay a rent. Right. What if you don't? Then we can squat. Okay, so then you're then you are more or less protected, right? Well, yes, but not officially. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Wait, what did your landlord say when you guys asked for a reduction? Um, he actually uh, said he was uh, going to the bank the next day to uh, talk about remortgaging the house, and then he was going to get back to us with an answer. But that was two days ago, so we haven't heard. Hmm. Well, it is the weekend, to be fair. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that's the problem, right? Like, I mean, some people, uh, you know. Some some people rent is their income, right? Yeah. So I don't know. It's a it's a brutal situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, is there uh, any final parting words from you? Um. Well, I just I'm just um, 
sitting here trying to remain optimistic that uh, as I'm slowly developing a little business on the side, hopefully a lot of other people are, and I think the future is going to be in e-commerce, and uh, that's all I can think of right now. Yeah, I remember you telling me six months ago, you said the internet's going to be huge. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's right. You know what? There's always opportunities out there, right? And if you're reasonably intelligent and hardworking, you know, stuff, stuff does come up, right? Yeah. I'm not just laying on a couch. I'm like thinking about what, how to make money. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? That's what they keep telling us. They, how hard is it to stay on a couch? And I'm like, it's hard. I would rather work, man. I don't want to stay on a goddamn couch. I hate it. Hate it. It's the best way to go into a full-blown depression. Yeah. <sighs> Jeez, yeah, it's just, ugh, I wouldn't even get started. Man. I don't know why anyone finds it enjoyable. Yeah, well, I, you know what? I tell people, I say, look, man, look at this face. This is my moneymaker, okay? I can't let the hair get too long. I got to cut my hair, you know? I got I to gotta have access to quality razors to be able to groom this beard, you know? I don't just pop up like this magically, you know? This takes work. You haven't, have you trained the girls? Uh, well, they're, they're cooking and stuff like that. Right. It's oh, cute. Free, free and yeah. You know, I might, I might be one of the only people that's actually losing weight during this lockdown. I never realized how I much I might be losing weight too. Oh, okay. Well, you mean, I... good though. yeah. Well, the, um, I don't, I never realized how much I used to go to restaurants. Oh yeah. I'm big, like I'm baking everything. Like I'm baking bread and everything. Yeah, well, I have to. I don't know how much uh, cooking takes up your day. <laughs> yeah, it does take up a lot. But I, I used to have this app on my phone that would pop up um, anytime a buffet was opening within 10 oh kilometers God. from me. Yeah, it would send an alert. And I would drive over to the buffet and. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nuts. I can't do that anymore. Did you bring Darren? Yeah, I used to, I'd bring the whole crew. Whoever was able to go on short notice and, uh, and do some damage. Like, there go all our profits. Yeah. You eat some vegetables. <laughs> he used to say to me, I'm like, oh, puh. anyways, we digress, right? Yeah. So shall we sign off then? Good fun. All right. Okay. Until yeah. next week, Angie, send us off, will you? Until next week, this is the COVID Chronicles. Is this number 41? No. Or? no, this is the culture cast tonight. Oh, it's a culture cast. That's right. Okay. Culture cast. All right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the numbers are, though. <laughs> uh, they go from um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, oh. 8, 9, 10, and then they start repeating. <laughs> All right. See you later. Say hi to Suki. All right.